Hello, I'm Ben. I live and work full-time in my New Horizons fifth wheel, 38-foot fifth wheel RV. I've been living full-time for, gosh, I think it's four years now. This is my second rig. Just picked this one up in April. It's now uh, September. The purpose of today's video is to cover tips and tricks for the mini split system. Now, some of this is going to be a little bit specific to New Horizons, but a lot of it is going to be specific to any mini split installation, whether you've done it yourself or someone else's mini split installation. Of course, there's differences between manufacturers and placement and the actual model numbers and sizes and all that kind of stuff. But hopefully this will give you a sense of the things to pay attention to, to think about while you're doing selection and design and installation and, and all that sort of thing. And for you, New Horizons owners, things specifically that uh, I recommend that you do in order to make the most out of your system and uh, perhaps also give even give you a comparison point um, as you know how is your system working compared to mine uh, in case you're wondering um, you know maybe your system isn't doing as well as you thought it should or something of that nature let's chat I'm happy to help and so that's the exact point of this video so let's uh, get into what am I going to cover? There's actually quite a bit to cover, but I'm going to attempt to be as efficient as possible <laughs> possible about this. So we're going to talk about sizing. So the the size of the cassettes, the size of the outdoor unit, since the mini split consists of an outdoor unit and the indoor units. Some uh, some tips and tricks around how to move air around, uh, setting the veins, the angle of the veins up here, like where the air should be going. The Wi-Fi module that you can get with these LGs, which I have installed, and uh, which gives you a really neat feature for scheduling and a whole bunch of other things, as well as integration into Siri and Amazon Echo. We'll talk about temperature settings and what the what settings that, that I use, because they they can be a little bit finicky, especially in an RV situation temperature sensors, the ones that are built in versus ones that you can, you can get external uh, temperature sensors as well as thermostats, which also have sensors in them. And uh, that's something I plan on doing. I haven't yet uh, done, but definitely I think needs to be done. We'll talk about wall mount units. So these are the cassette units, which do have a protrusion in the ceiling uh, through the roof. So this is a 24 inch by 24 inch cutout and there's a cap on top. So if you're looking to maximize um, space available on the roof for solar, then you might be considering wall mount. Now, I, New Horizons, I don't believe has yet done this, although they're, I think they're about to. So um, other DIYers and, and whatnot, they've used wall mounts. I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with that. It's just a level of experience, placement and that sort of thing. So there's, there's pros and cons, I think, to, to those. Um, I wish, in hindsight, part of me is like, I wish I had gone with, with a wall mount. I was convinced uh, not to do so, for better or for worse. But if I didn't have protrusions for these, that just would have meant more solar panels on the roof for me. So, um, but, yeah, you know, I'm doing okay with 3,300 watts on the, <laughs> on the roof. Um, uh, we'll talk about whether or not it's smart to drive or tow with the uh, mini split turned on. Uh, we'll talk about um, the outdoor unit fan, uh, the placement, keeping it out of the sun, having a filter for it, power consumption, which will be important if you if you do have a solar system, otherwise you're plugged in and you don't really care, um, the performance that you should expect out of the system, and how you can see whether or not you're getting the expected performance. Um, we'll talk about using these for heating versus for cooling. I'm up here in Yellowstone where my overnight lows are now in the low 30s and upper 20s and my daytime highs are in the 50s and I'm using these only for heat. I'm not using my propane now, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the defrost cycle that actually occurs when you're in heating mode. And um, all right, so my setup. So I have a 12K cassette here. This is, again, this is LG as provided by New Horizons. And the bedroom has a 9K cassette. and they look exactly the same. Um, they do make 18K cassettes. Uh, the, the difference um, is that the 18K cassettes require a different size line running back to the outdoor unit for the uh, refrigerant. Now, that's not something you're going to change after the fact. It will be very difficult to change after the fact. So if you're on the fence about it, you might go with 18 over 12. 
during the installation time. And I'm going to give you some tips about that because you can make a mistake on choosing something that's too big. So 9K is the smallest they make for the cassettes. I'm not entirely sure if they go smaller than that on the wall mount units, but the cassette for the bedroom at 9K, um, you know, the standard sort of bedroom size here is more than sufficient. In fact, it's actually too big. And the fact that it's too big will cause problems with your system performance. And we'll talk about that. Even if this were uh, a bathroom, I would still recommend staying with 9K. At 12K, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to cause problems. You would you would need to have a very large uh, bedroom and, and a very large room after that for you um, to consider going to a 12K or uh, a 12K uh, wall mount. In fact, I think a, a 9K wall mount here would, would likely satisfy both rooms uh, better than this cassette does. And we'll talk about the differences between why I think the cassettes and the wall mount units, um, you know, they have some different performance characteristics, characteristics with respect to airflow. RVs are a very odd shape, so that presents some challenges. So um, as far as me monitoring the system, I have, we'll swap off to a more interesting view. That's not my face. Charts and graphs, much more interesting than my face. So temperature sensor number one is the outdoor temperature, and that's in red on the graph here. So my overnight low was right at freezing, 32 degrees. Uh, the other two temperature sensors we're going to be interested in today is number four, and that's the room temperature as depicted by this little sensor right here, sort of in the middle of the room on top of the kitchen counter. It's pretty warm in here right now. That's actually just the sun coming in, even though it's this warm outside and the heat's not really on. And the temperature sensor number two, uh, which is reading just about 80 degrees, is another one of these remotes in the intake of my kitchen slash living room unit. So that's how I'm keeping an eye on, you know, the fact that it's 77 here and 80 here. There's a three degree temperature difference here, but I've seen as much as a 10 degree difference in here. And that just shows you how much, you know, the heat rising can be an issue. So that's my sort of monitoring setup in addition to the fact that I do, since I do have a solar system, I have a pretty nice, uh, a pretty nice insight into how much power is being consumed by the air conditioning or, or when it's in heat mode, basically how much power the mini split is using. So right now my loads are, you know, if the mini split isn't running, I'm typically using somewhere between uh, 250 to 300 watts during the day at night that I can, that can actually go down to a hundred 100, uh, 100 watts or, or even I've seen even as low as 70. So it just depends on whether the fridge is running and things like that. Anyway, the point is when that's reading 1500 watts, 2000 watts, I can subtract, you know, roughly 300 watts and I can see roughly how much power the mini split is using. So that's going to be important when we do come to that topic. So let's take out my cheat sheet here. And my next bullet point to to, to talk about was, well, how's it working? Well, <laughs> um, I'm actually quite happy with it now. Now we have had to go through some, some tweaks. We'll get into that. And that's why I'm making this video is because you can be happy with the mini split in the RV, but you're gonna um, wanna make some tweaks. You're gonna just wanna be a little bit more informed about uh, sort of the, what, just what it's like to have a mini split in an RV. So um, I've used it for both air conditioning and now for heating and in both situations it's working great um, there are it, it can work better so there are going to be a couple of things i'm going to do and we'll talk about that to try to improve it even further so let's talk about tips shall we that's probably the most interesting part so i've got a ceiling fan but if you don't have a ceiling fan you will probably want some form of fan somewhere, whether it's just like a little tabletop or something. You need to circulate the air in the room, especially when you're heating. It's not necessarily as important when you're cooling because cold air sinks, but hot air rises. And that, that goes back to my comment about how much warmer it is up here than it is down here. Now, if you don't have something like this circulating your air, the hot air is gonna rise and collect to the, to the top of the ceiling. And this is a pretty tall ceiling. And you'll know that that's happening because when you walk up these stairs and you and and your head's up here, you're going to feel a pretty big temperature difference. 
That's even more pronounced when you're using the propane heat because the air coming out of the registers here is quite a bit hotter than what comes out of the mini split. But you're still going to run into that. So I'm pretty much running this 24-7. This consumes almost no power. I mean, it's like 10 watts or something. So from a solar perspective, if, you, if you're caring about that, it's not a big deal. So experiment with running the, the blades in forward or reverse. It, it depends on your layout. Um, sometimes one direction or the other might provide um, better results for you. So tip, that's tip number one. Tip number two, this is going to go into my sizing um, conversation. I originally started out with a 9K here for the common area, not big enough. 12K, now this is a 38-foot rig, um, so if you have a bigger rig, then uh, you might consider an 18K here or possibly two 12s, which, which I, um, I might actually recommend against. I don't know that we, anybody's got enough experience with that, and they might like fight each other. I don't know that you would get a great experience out of that. I think you would just want a bigger, a bigger unit. Um, so you can do 18K here or um, go with a wall mount unit perhaps up here. You want the wall mount unit to be on the short side, but well, I've got a whole separate bullet point about wall mount units. <laughs> so anyway, sizing. At least 12K in the common area here. For me, this is just about enough. And if it is 90 degrees outside, I have no problem maintaining 72. And depending on whether it's humid outside or not, there's different, you know, and where the sun is hitting your rig and all that kind of stuff, um, different things can happen. But... When you're talking about the bedroom, 9K. I know I wish I could make that smaller. And there is a there is a, a trick and a reason for employing this trick. So let's talk about why this is a problem. 9K is going to cool this room down so quickly that even in its lowest power mode, it's gonna get so cold or warm in here that it's going to shut off. You generally speaking don't want these to be turning it off, on and off. You don't want them to be cycling. I found this thing to be cycling um, on and off to the tune of every couple of minutes, right? And that is going to destroy the performance of your entire system, not just for this room. If this room starts cycling, that is not going to start putting out the uh, as cold or hot of uh, air as it's supposed to. And now that room is going to have a problem maintaining the proper temperature setting. So you at, you really need to prevent these systems from cycling on and off. So please do not make these bigger than they need it to be. In my case, since this is the smallest it needs to be, and it's still too big, what I have done is I've used the the, uh, the remote or the app, if you've got the Wi-Fi um, uh, module installed in here, then you can set the fan speed to low, and that means it'll take longer for it to adjust the air temperature in here and reduce the chance of cycling. So set the te temperature to low. Okay, um, temperature settings and temperature sensors. I talked about the sensors and, and, and where, you, you know, so instead of having the temperature sensor built into here, that might actually be the best scenario for the bedroom. Um, this room is so small that I don't know where, at least with a cassette, right? Because the air is coming out in, in all four directions. If I put a temperature sensor anywhere along the wall line here, you know, except maybe like the far corner over here, but that's not great because that's an outside wall and it's kind of blocked. And you know, I, I just, I have no idea where on earth I would put a temperature sensor in here. That's not going to get directly hit with air from the mini split. So you, you're going to get a false reading. But anyway, you it, it, for the living room, you could certainly find something. And I would recommend using a temperature sensor and just placing one around the room to find out where it's best suited for your rig. Every rig's different. Air, everybody's airflow is different. And, you know, I, I, you probably can't really just pick a standard spot, but you want it to be as far away from the air, air output as possible, not on an outside wall and hopefully not receiving any sunlight either. So a temperature sensor or a thermostat, um, they've got some nice wall mount thermostats that, that include temperature sensors. And you just have to run a wire back into the unit, which isn't yeah, it's really easy to physically to do the installation. Running the wire is really the hard part and making it look nice. So <laughs> I'll be doing that at some point and I'll report back on that. So sizing, super, super important. Um, in fact, that actually brings me to wall mount or not. Um, wall mount in here uh, would be challenging, right? This, For example, the slide out, if I had a wall mount here, the slide out would run into the wall mount unit. Um, 
the wall mount unit goes into the wall, so my pocket door wouldn't work. We'd have to, you know, go to a, a normal door. That's going to protrude into the bathroom. I mean, there's there's just design, physical design considerations involved in a wall mount unit. You want the wall mount unit, and here's a you know a better example of this is to go in here. You want the wall mount unit to be on the short wall side so that it's throwing air across the room. So either in my case, in the kitchen or up here. And you're going to need to give it plenty of room to be able to throw the air across the room, um, both sort of up here as well as, you know, the, the want, you want the vent to be able to angle down and throw air down into the room because you're going to typically have the vents just kind of cycling up and down like this. So it tries to evenly throw the air around and I don't actually know where the intake for the wall mount units is, but you're going to need to leave plenty of room uh, around those so that it's sucking up air that needs to be conditioned um, appropriately. So you, you just you know you got to watch your the specifications, the manufacturer specifications for clearances and all that sort of thing, and just kind of think about what's going on in the room. Okay. Um, the reason that you don't want to put it on the long side is, first of all, it's not going to really reach the entire room. They do, the vents can, you know, cycle around like this left and right as well, and that might cause it to, to reach out over here. But what's going to happen is the air is going to kind of hit the wall here and bounce back and get sucked back in kind of early, if you will, before the rest of the room is conditioned. So that's not going to give you as good of a performance. However, I will say, that that is most likely going to provide better performance than having the four-way ceiling cassette here in the middle of the room because now what's happening is the air is coming out you know in all four directions not very far bouncing off and coming back in and that is trust me happening because i've stood up there i put my hand up there and i can feel the air the cold air coming back in and of course i can see what's happening using the temperature sensors now you can avoid um, some of that a little bit, and I have done that in my case. You can you can set the angle of the veins on the sides where you're going to have that sort of blowback occur. Set them to be as closed as possible. You can't fully close them, but you can angle them to mostly closed. And that has resolved most of my issues. So that's a big uh, tip for getting these things to condition your room well. If you've got cassettes, go in and use the remote to set your vein angles. Now, hopefully you have the Wi-Fi module, and if you're doing a new build, request the Wi-Fi module. If, you're, um, if you've already got these, they're like 80 bucks a piece or something like that, very easy to install. So let's go into the bedroom where I can actually reach the cassette, and I'll show you about the Wi-Fi module, and then I'll show you how to adjust this with the remote. So. To install the Wi-Fi module, you're just going to pull on these two things here, and this this will pop down. Okay, and there's you'll see some there's uh, some duct not duct tape but ducting tape here, and um, that's actually a good thing. If you if you don't have this, you might want to you might want to employ this because what happens is the angle of the installation here due to the angle of the roof was causing me to not have a good seal between the ceiling and the uh, and the cassette itself so air from here would internally cycle right back in to the unit because there was a there was a gap here that allowed that to occur so we had to seal it off here so anyway i'm not gonna because of because this is all taped up right now i don't want to pull that tape off but all you have to do is remove these two screws you're going to uh, take the wire from this it's basically just a usb uh, plug and you'll find the connector in here. It's it's documented that the, the picture in the documentation is wrong, but the, the label of the connector is, cor is correct. It's a very small label, so you're gonna need a flashlight and some good eyes <laughs> to find it. I wish I could easily take this off and just show you exactly where it is, but plug that in. Uh, and then you plug in, um, you'll, you see this moves around. So this is just a USB connection to this, and this is just the, the holder, double side sticky tape, and that's it as far as the physical installation is done. And then to get it working, I actually had to Google this. It's not in the documentation anywhere, um, but you have to press, uh, actually I'm not remembering the buttons to press now. You press two buttons at the same time 
for a long period of time. I wish I could remember. You'll have to Google it. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'll Google it and put it in the description for you. you and uh, you press them for a long period of time, and that puts this Wi-Fi module into pairing mode. You'll hear a, a beep, and I believe it starts blinking. And then once that's in pairing mode, then you can open the app and add the uh, the, the uh, Wi-Fi module. It's it's clear as mud. Um, it was probably the most painful part of the setup. It took me I, I, probably 45 minutes to <laughs> to get through that and figure it out. The first time, the second time was was a piece of cake once I knew what I was doing. But goodness, the, the documentation is horrible. So anyway, vein angles. So here's the remote, and the top, sort of the top left of the remote, right underneath the battery indicator, is what we're going to pay attention to the most here. So right now, there is no symbol up there. Right now, we'll just we'll just keep saying right now and, until it gets really repetitive. <laughs> If I press swing, okay, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna point this at the wall so I don't actually uh, cause that to occur. So I'm just gonna press swing, and it, right? And you can, because this is an infrared remote, right? I'm blocking the infrared signal. So let's get out of the light if I can here. Now you can see the icon. Okay, that's gonna cause the veins to swing up and down. Now there is another swing mode here that doesn't apply to the cassettes. This would apply to a wall mount unit or some other unit that has uh, a side-to-side -side capabilities, right? And we don't have that. It's only up and down. So you, you can press this and, the, and another icon will show up, right? But, <laughs> but it's not going to do anything. So we're going we're gonna to shut those two off. We don't want that. In an RV, uh, as much as you might think you want that, you don't because that's just going to cause the air to feed back into itself. And that's just... That's going to be a major cause of system performance problems. What you do want to do is manually set your vein angles. So I'm going to press vein angle here. And we're going to look. Now, this is actually on right now, but the, the veins are in a particular location or direction right now, and they're not moving. So, so as soon as I press vein angle, you hear the beep. And one of the veins will move all the way open and then go back to its set point. Now, in, in, that's actually different than it was before, but, but, but on the remote, the set point is, is different than I had it set on the app. So the set point, you can see, if we look real closely here, you can see that there's a line that's gonna move. I'm gonna use the temperature up and down buttons. That line moves, right? That's the angle of the vent. So if I'm, I'm gonna put it uh, all the way open here, and now you can see the vent is all the way open. And if I move it up, right, it moves that, that vein. So the blinking line here is meant to indicate which vein you're moving. But, I mean, it depends on how you're, you know, which way you're looking at this. So it's kind of hard to know which one's which. But once you've oriented yourself to the first one, it gets a little easier. Of course, you're going to press vein angle again. And now another one's going to blink. But... You don't know if it's going to be the left one or the right one, but in this case, it ends up being the right one. And so it'll do the same thing, open up and then go back to its set point. So wait for it to go through that that fate, that sort of uh, phase of, I don't know what you want to call it, just be patient. <laughs> and um, now we can adjust its vein angle, right? Similar sort of situation. If I push the button, it moves, right? And so you basically just you just go through all four of those settings, and now that I've made my settings changes, I press vein angle again. Now all that goes away, and it doesn't look like you've actually set anything, but you actually are done, and you you have set the vein angles, and they are set the way you left them. The only time uh, there are three times when those uh, will change that I have observed. Number one, if you shut the unit off, uh, the veins will all uh, close. The second time I have seen this uh, change on its own without my own input is if you go into jet cool mode. Again, of course, you're going to be in, in cooling mode. If you hit jet cool mode, that will force all of the veins to be wide open, and there is no way to override that. Okay. The third way I've seen this happen is if the temperature differential <clears throat> between the actual room temperature and the set point is high enough, and that's either 7 or 10 degrees, I forget. 
it will again sort of automatically go into jet cool mode. It won't show that, but it will open all the veins um, fully. So don't worry if that's happening to you, um, just keep that in mind, but otherwise the veins will stay um, as you've configured them. Okay, all right, cool. What's next? Let's talk about the, uh, we'll put that off to later a little bit. So we'll talk about the uh, performance as far as has your system been properly installed? And I have to say, um, I've I've struggled with this every single time I've had the system serviced, which caused uh, essentially any time the refrigerant line had been opened, so they had to drain and refill it. Every time I had to have them come back, and and by them I mean the the HVAC tech come back, not New Horizons, uh, and uh, and adjust. So it 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 behooves you to make sure that your system is performing the way it's supposed to. I only know how to test this right now in cooling mode. Um, I don't know how to really test it per se in heating mode, um, though I suppose what I could do is uh, wait for the room to get cool and set this to max heat and observe the temperature differential between the intake and the output. In cooling mode, you should have somewhere, so here, uh, let me back up a second. To, to perform the test, Turn on one zone, set it to uh, cold, but don't use jet cool and don't set it so cold that it's like 10 degrees colder than the current room temperature. You don't want this to go into jet cool mode. That's going to affect your temperature uh, reading because jet cool mode puts the fan on, on ultra high and the temperature differential is not going to be as high as it should be. Okay, but it won't be that far off, but the best thing to do is just set it to nice and cold. Um, but not too cold, right? And use a meat thermometer, not an infrared gun, um, and put the meat thermometer right here and let it stabilize. And then do the same thing right in the output. And you should have somewhere between a 22 to 24 degree temperature difference between the two if your system is performing optimally. Now, it will take time for it to reach a 22 to 24 degree split. So make sure it's been running for 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes is, uh, is my recommendation before you perform that test and uh, before you start freaking out if it's different. If it's any lower than 20, you have a problem, right? Either you're doing the test wrong or, or you have a problem, right? Every single time I had an actual problem, it was below 20 degrees. When they initially did the test and initially charged it up, they were reading a 20 to 22 degree split. Uh, later that day, nope, I was getting a 17 degree split. Had them come back and they added a significant amount of refrigerant and that got me up to the 22 to 24 degree split and I was able to maintain interior temperature. It was, it's amazing how much uh, stronger the air conditioning is with a 24 degree split than it is with a 20 or an 18 degree split. So get up into those 20s for sure, okay? Um, heating versus cooling. Uh, I think I've covered pretty much all the little things that, are, that occur, you know, heat rising and that sort of stuff. And um, the temperature set points, I think, is one thing I haven't really quite covered. Because heat rises, it, this thing thinks the temperature is, is completely wrong. So, you know, I read... 76 here in the room. I remember if I have another one of those up in the ceiling. It thinks it's 80. Alexa, what's the temperature of the kitchen? The kitchen temperature is 87 degrees. <laughs> right, and it thinks it's 87. Completely whack. I mean, that's why I need a, 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 an external temperature sensor. Fortunately, it, uh, I don't know, there's like some weird algorithm in there that just maybe because it knows it's in heating mode and heat rises, maybe it uh, adjusts for that. Because I have that, uh, Alexa, what's the kitchen set to? The heat's set to 77. I, I have it set for 77 and it was just on and it just shut off. And you can see, um, you know, this is this is a little bit of a this is a bad time of the day for me to do the recording because typically what happens is I this reads five degrees lower than the set point and it believes it's like ten to fifteen degrees warmer uh, than 
my thermometer that's up in there does. So wild, crazy readings. The short answer here is in heating mode, I set it to five degrees above what my what I want my temperature sensor here to read. So during the day, that's at 77. So it tends to be about 72 in here. In cooling mode, it's a little bit different. Um, the temperature spread it can change depending on the sun and, all, and that sort of thing. In fact, that's what actually what's happening right now is uh, the sun has caused my temperature to come up in here. The, the, having the sun come in through windows and hit the side and all that sort of stuff, it's amazing how much that heats up the rig. Despite how well insulated the New Horizon units are, that's still a huge factor and is definitely a huge factor from a cooling perspective. Anyway, I tend to set that to a two to, two to, three, two to three degree temperature uh, uh, degrees lower than I want my actual temperature to be. And as the night comes around and the sun isn't hitting the rig, it will actually maintain the temperature you set it to. So that ends up being too cold. So I do have to adjust it uh, throughout the day, unfortunately. So uh, some tricks with respect to that. Um, there is a, from he in heating mode, there is a defrost cycle that will occur uh, for those of you who are uh, who don't have solar systems, you won't care about that too much, except that you will occasionally hear the compressor running at at full speed, like way higher than you would would hear it, even if you turn both zones on maximum. It goes even faster than that, and it consumes uh, a fair amount of power. And instead of cold air coming out of the outdoor unit, uh, there'll be warm air coming out, and um, that's normal. That's just a defrost cycle. For those of you who do care about the numbers for solar uh, power purposes, the defrost cycle is con consumes like 2,700 watts. It's, it's pretty insane. The maximum I see uh, for air conditioning, if I turn them both on and it's like super hot outside and, 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 and both zones are on, then I'll see somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, maybe 2,000 watts of uh, power. In heat mode, if I have them both running, Maximum, I might see 2,300 watts um, uh, of power being used at max, but not, not 2,700. So keep that in mind, um, not only just from the, from the size of your panels, size of your battery bank, and the size of your inverters, right? Um, you need to make sure that both uh, legs of your inverters are capable of handling, you know, 1,400 watts each leg just for the air conditioning, in addition to all of your other loads. And let's talk about, let's see, the let's, we'll, we'll walk outside we'll, and talk about the outdoor unit in a sec. I think that's my last topic I have written down. So let's go do that. Okay, here's the outdoor unit as New Horizons configures it. So the, the outdoor unit is actually inside the RV. In this case, it's in the basement and it's enclosed. And the airflow comes out this way and it's sucked in from underneath. Now. I mention all that because uh, that plays an important role in the next couple of topics. Number one, while you're driving down the road, I have run it, uh, and it works, but there's a couple things to be aware of. You're, you have 70 mile an hour winds coming across the fan like this, so it's not able to eject the air nearly as efficiently as it otherwise would. So that affects the system performance and it draws quite a bit uh, more power as a result. So. I try not to do it unless I feel like I need to keep the interior uh, cool so that I, I don't have to wait uh, you know, a couple hours to get the interior temperature down. But now that the system is, is properly charged up and, and performing the way it needs to be with all the way my tweaks and things like that, that's really not as much of an issue. So I don't, I don't really feel the urge to keep the system running while I'm driving. The second reason that's not necessarily the best idea. Again, it's not gonna hurt really anything. Um, but the, there is no filter underneath. So if you're on the highway, if you're on uh, pavement, not such a big deal. If you do end up driving down gravel, dirt road, you know, plenty of campgrounds or, or dirt, doing boondocking like I am, you're definitely driving down dirt. The dust that's being kicked up from the truck and whatnot is going to go up in, into your pants here and prematurely clog them. Again, it's not going to damage something, but you're going to have to get in there and clean a lot more often and uh, check that a lot more often. So just keep that in mind. And the last thing, and you can kind of see this by the shadow being cast in here, is sun can go in there and make the, 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 yeah, the outdoor unit. Not such a bad thing in the winter, uh, but in the summer, you really don't want the sun adding additional heat load to this unit. So try and park your rig. 
rig um, so that the, the sun is the, basically your afternoon sun is not hitting this side of the rig if you can or if you're doing an install yourself you just turn it on um, then you know maybe locate this in, in such a way that it's not going to get hit by the sun and actually one more thing uh, if it's windy and I, I, I encountered this in the Badlands a number of times. If the wind is traveling in this direction towards the fan, and it's strong, gusty winds, 20, 30 miles an hour, then that's going to back feed the fan, and the fan will not be able to push the air out. It's not gonna be able to cool or warm those fins up like it's supposed to be able to. Your system performance will suffer, your interior temperatures will suffer. So uh, wind can certainly be a factor. That's a little harder to control. Maybe you can park your rig in a, in a certain way, but what I might end up doing, and they actually commercially make these if you have mini splits installed for your house, they do make uh, baffles that, that it would install. Actually, a lot of them are, are installed below and they just, they come up like this. And so they allow the air to come out and up. And that's, you know, going up is probably uh, the best idea in the summer, right? Because since what's coming out of here is hot, you want the air to come up. You could you could have the air come out and, and down, um, and so maybe putting an awning or something like this um, over the top and pulling it down when it's really windy uh, would uh, would assist in that situation. So, okay, I think that's it for my outdoor unit bet here. But while I'm out here, I did mention sun load and things like that. I forgot to mention. Get awnings on all of your windows, if possible, okay? Getting the sun off of the side of your rig in the summer is, I, I cannot stress how important that is. It's amazing, these are really well insulated, but it's amazing how much of a difference having the sun off of your windows will make. One last thing, solar, uh, you know, electrical usage for you, uh, for, for, for you guys who are on the solar, this system, I've got, again, I've got 3,300 watts of solar on the roof. And if it's 90 degrees, my general rule of thumb is if it's 90 degrees or less outside, I have infinite um, supply as even running my air conditioning, okay? And in, in the, the cold weather, it's a completely different story. Using the mini split in, in heat mode uses more power and uh, in a number of different ways. So instead of, you know, say 700 watts, right? My, my heat's kind of on low right now. Instead of 700 watts, I'm using a thousand watts. Uh, at max, instead of using maybe 1800 to 2000 watts, I'm using 2200 to 2400 watts. Now, couple that with the fact that you have the angle of your sun, of the, your sun, of our sun. The angle of the sun is, uh, it is uh, I don't know, higher, lower? <laughs> the sun is lower on the sky. You are not producing as much uh, so peak solar and the days are shorter, which means you're not producing as much solar energy throughout the entire day. And that means your nights are longer, which means you have more demand for uh, heating. And even worse, it gets compounded with uh, clouds, unlike, unlike when you're cooling like clouds can be a good thing because you don't have as much heat coming in from the sun hitting the rv if there are clouds in the winter that means it's going to be colder which means you need even more heat and you're not getting the sunlight you need to replenish that so i can definitely tell you um with when i had daytime highs of 70 like just about 70 68 70 degrees and it would last for a couple hours and the overnight lows were were 50 no problem now that I'm in a situation where my daytime highs are in the 50s, right, and my overnight lows are like th freezing, 32 or upper 20s, not enough power. I have my system configured to connect to shore and start charging the batteries when I go below 50%, and that's exactly what happened last night. I just, I just use way more power he heating the rig. But again, that's really only important from a solar perspective. Um, in my case, if I had 4,000 watts of solar panels up there instead of 3,350, I'm not even sure that would be enough. I mean, you would need, you would really need an incredible solar setup for the for you to um, to do this purely off solar. But that's okay. You can supplement that, of course, with the generator, and you can supplement it with propane too. So that is certainly another trick that I have done. Like if I've uh, forgotten to turn on the heat in the morning, I'll use the propane uh, at the same time just to get the room temperature um, warm a lot more quickly. 
Um, which reminds me, one little key feature of the app I forgot to mention, it has the ability to schedule. So in fact, if I do remember to do what I'm supposed to do, is I'll set the um, schedule on the app to turn on the heat one hour before I'm supposed to wake up. And that way the rooms are nice and warm when I do wake up, okay? All right. Thanks for watching. Subscribe, please. That uh, encourages me to make more of these. And as always, uh, please make any comments, questions. I'm happy to answer them for you. Take care, guys. Thanks again for watching.